Today is March 13, 2024, and it is Wednesday. I have an exam next Monday, so I figured I might as well tell you guys what's going on with the fish room. I wanted to show you guys some things, including these DIY lids that I made, as well as talk a little bit more about breeding tetras and all the conditioning, all that stuff that don't make the cut to those final videos. In my opinion, these vlogs are where you are going to get little tips and tricks that I've been talking about because at the end of the day, when I make a breeding video, especially like tetras or mono shrimps or something, my main focus is to keep everybody engaged, everyone who might you know, watch that video. But a lot of times things like my conditioning regimen and all those little factors that I think about before I make those big decisions that end up in the videos don't actually get to be talked a little bit more about. So I'm gonna talk more about the background, everything, and I'm going to show you what the fish room looks like. Let's get into it. So this is my 75 gallon. I've been struggling with algae for the last like two, three months. Ever since I set it up, there was a bunch of brown algae, diatoms, you know, dinoflagellates, whatever you wanna call it, just plaguing me. But I've really been able to dial in that algae because of a couple of different things. So the first thing that I did was I reduced the photo period to around five to six hours, which is to me nowhere near enough to grow plants. But in my opinion, like I do have CO2 in the back over there. There's an injector, injector or a diffuser. And what it does is it goes up and then that port in the back is the outflow from my canister filter. So a little tubing. So then it just kind of pushes all the bubbles and circulates around the tank. So it pushes the current this way, the water goes here and circulates all the way over in the back. That is the uh, influx or the inflow. So water gets taken up to the sponge filter, I mean, sorry, to the canister filter in the back, gets pushed back out over here and the cycle continues. I've got a couple of different fish stocked in here. So most notably, you have a small school of the uh, Congo Tetras. I really like Congo Tetras. The males are super colorful. So you can actually tell the males and females apart. So for example, that green one right here, that's the female. They're a little bit more green. The males have that like white outline on the fins as they get older, they'll also have some fin extensions. But for now, I've got two females. It's got one female in the back over here and another one right here. Um, and then the rest are all males. And then I've got the rummy nose tetras. I will always, always have this fish. It's one of my favorite fish and uh, one of the fish that I'm going to be breeding soon. So I'm trying to fatten them up. You can see a nice female over here. She's got a lot of eggs in her already. You can kind of tell because of how fat she is even without feeding. So whenever you are conditioning your fish and you're trying to figure out males and female tetras or basically any fish in general, especially tetras where sometimes it's hard to tell males from females, the females are always going to be very, very thick and plump even before you feed them. The males on the other hand will always be more slender. Now obviously I say always, but you still have to look at the indi individual species and the age, but the males are mostly slender throughout. So like this woman, this girl right here, she's got a really nice like um, um, belly, right? And, and it's not just the underside, but the side profile. She'll also, if you look at her, she'll be very um, torpedo or teardrop shaped compared to a male that's like very, very thin. She'll look like this. And then of course, we've got the cardinal tetras. Again, like same, same story here with the cardinals. The females are always going to be a little bit thicker, especially when they are of breeding age. And then the males are gonna be very, very thin. And then I also have some, uh, these are mosquito fish. So wild caught, where'd it go? Mosquito fish, that's a female. They're related to cuppies. So that's a male, that's a female, male, female. And so the way you sex them is the same way. The, the males will have their anal fin like this, very, very long. And then the females will have that dark spot if they're pregnant and will have that triangular fin. Um, so yeah, that's how you tell. Female and male. Another female that's not pregnant. And then I have the German Blue Rams, one of my absolute favorites. I have a couple in here, I think three or four. Um, one of the females is over here. So she's really cute. She's like the smallest one, the runt. So her colors aren't fully developed. 
But the other one, like, look at that male in the back. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful fish. And then I've got some snails. I've got a pleco or two in there. And that's about the stocking for now. Um, I'm thinking about adding some more tetras, maybe some uh, green neons, which are down here. And I'll talk about them in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the lids. These are DIY lids. And what I do is I'll just measure the length from the inside here onto the other part of this side here, right, you know, like where this brace is and do the same on the back. So for the 75 gallon, I have four panels, four identical panels that are the same measurements and it is nine by 22 inches. So front and back is nine. And then this here is 22 inches. Don't just take the measurement of the tank and divide by two because um, even for like a 10 gallon tank, that rim will take up some, um, some of that space. So if you do do that, you're gonna get a much larger piece of glass than you actually need. So if you guys think, if I push it all the way on one side, I have about like a quarter of an inch, you know, just free here. So that's what I do to make sure that everything moves very smoothly. And then I have these little black bars. You'll see them on the sides here as well as the front. And what those are, are binding bars for like, um, here, let me try, show you this. These are binding bars for um, binding pieces of paper in the office. I'll take one out. And if you've ever seen these, these are kind of triangular looking bars and they have a slit in the front here in the middle. Okay, so that kind of opens up like this all the way down and these will just kind of clip right onto the side of your glass and it really prevents you know the slide the, the glass from getting chipped as well as allows the two panels to slide smoothly you guys see that it's very very smooth and that's because of the binding bars it's essentially like a rail system now get this the ones on the bottom the panel in the back here it doesn't have any binding bars on it only the one on the front here has the bars what that does is it raises, it creates a small difference of height in between these two, um, um, these two panels because what I found is that if you don't have these binding bars, not only are you not protecting you know, the glass from getting chipped, but because of the moisture of the fish tank and the evaporation, it'll create like this thin layer of water between the two panels and that'll really stick the two glass pieces together. So the binding bars are essentially absolutely necessary you don't have to use the binding bars of course you could diy something else you could use like wooden dowels or something but binding bars were relatively cheap and i got a 25 pack this is a, this is a 40 sheet size okay and this is really good because it creates quite a lot of distance um but you can also get it in 20 20 sheet size and what that just means is this bar can fit 40 sheets of paper um, if they actually use it for the office. Another thing is when you do get the glass cut, okay, like this edges are gonna be super, super sharp. So I have actually used sandpaper as a project pack. So there's a couple of different sizes of the sandpaper. I use the 80 grit and the 120 grit the most. Okay, and the smaller the number, the bigger the sand particles, the more abrasive the sandpaper will feel. And then because like most of the time, the extra fine 400 grit is going to be for like um, oh, for polishing. But essentially, I'm really only using the larger grit numbers. So if you have sandpaper at home, obviously just use that. It doesn't matter what grit it is. I like the 80 to 120. When you are actually um, kind of sanding your glass, be really careful. See, this is a spray bottle. It's just water in here. And I used basically the entire entire bottle and what i do is i'll spray the sandpaper as well as the glass because when you shave glass and when you start to kind of sand glass down it creates these tiny small particles of glass if you breathe it in it could be a lot of trouble it could really screw up your lungs so make sure you either you don't you're going outside you're wearing a mask and you're protecting yourself from that and that's why a lot of times people gl cut glass um especially like grinding things they spray a bunch of water. That's to prevent that glass dust from getting everywhere, everywhere in the machines, in your lungs. It's not healthy. So that's the only thing. 
Overall, I would say it's about 60-70% of the price of the uh, actual lids that Aquion sells. I don't like those lids because they have those the stupid hinge in here. And the problem with the hinge is I can't lift it up too much, especially since I only have a few inches of clearance. So this design, by pushing it backwards, you know, I can, I can even remove this entire panel, remove the back panel, and it really, really helps. Another thing is it allows that light to shine straight through because um, the, the, the flip version, the Aquion or Aquion version that, actually, that they actually sell to fit this, um, first of all, it's, it's expensive. And then they have those ugly pieces of plastic that I just hate looking at. So I decided to build my own. It's also much cheaper and really, really good bang for your buck. I got my glass cut at Lowe's. It was only about $25, $30 for all four pieces. It was a really, really good deal. You'll see that I didn't actually cut the binding bars out. So the glass kind of stops and then the binding bars stick out past it. What this does is as I slide it back, it allows me to not hit the back here too hard. Cause sometimes when you know, you're moving back and forth, up and left and right, you don't want to hit like the, you know, the, the, the cords or the, or the filter outflows in the back. So they stop me from also doing that. But yeah, for certain areas, like there's a gap here and that allows all the hosing to run through all the airlines. I've got some zip ties over here, I'm trying to propagate these uh, frogs looking, uh, these little ivies, I forgot the name of it. You'll see it down below. But I promise you, once you make them, they're going to last for years. Like, look at this one right here. This is my 10 gallon one. I've had this panel for years. This is one of my original aquascapes or aquarium lids and it's been working perfectly fine i've got another one on this one right here and uh yeah so let's talk a little bit about these two tanks now that we're down there these are my uh blue dreams and then my green jade shrimp colonies i also have a lot of uh, celestial pearl daniels in there they're all in the filter in the back so i'm gonna see if i can move that and they'll come screaming out look at that they're all in the back there. And the issue with Celestial, I don't want to like hit any of them. But okay, now I've just like stirred the hornet's nest. That's fine. Um, there's a lot of Celestial Pearl Danios. There's some green neon tetras in there. And the female neon tetras, green neon tetras are in there. And I'm trying to separate them so that when I do breed them, the males see the females and they start to breed automatically. These guys aren't of age yet. They're still pretty young. I've tried, and look, I've look, I've tried breeding the green neon tetras, and the only things I got were infertile eggs, which absolutely sucks. But I think it's just because they're young. I think they got, you know, because in my opinion, if I got the water parameters and the breeding contraptions wrong, then they're not going to breed. So I think it's really just the the youngness or the relative young juveniles are in there so i'm going to try again in about two weeks same setup and if that doesn't work then i'm going to you know say like hmm, maybe it's something else but for now since that setup works um i'm just gonna keep that there i do think that this tank needs a little bit more hiding places um so i might add some of this moss in here but this tank, honestly, the moss was kind of distributed between both of these. But I was trying to breed the Celestial Pearl Danios, and that's why I had all of that happening. But in my opinion, I don't think they feel safe enough to breed in this tank. So I either have to cover the sides with some fabric or something, make them feel more you know, secluded and, and safe, or I'll have to add more hiding places. I also have the mono shrimps in these two tanks, always. And I always keep a mono shrimp. For those of you that are wondering what I use to feed my fish and shrimps, um, I have these for my shrimps and anything from Amano shrimps to Neocaridina will eat these. These are the crab cuisine uh, for crustaceans made by Hakari and they're sinking, they're really big and it's really nice because I, every time I, I do this I see that the Amano shrimps will actually just come and take an entire pellet. Uh, I don't know if they'll do that for me right now because I'm right in front of them and most of my fish are camera shy, but we'll try it out. All right, I've got some 
the crab cuisine. Just gonna sprinkle it on one side here and then sprinkle the rest on the other one. So they sink right to the bottom. The pesky fish won't get to it. And uh, after a while, the shrimp will come and find it. So looking forward to that. So going back to the 75 gallon, um, looking at all the plants in the back. So this is CO2 infused, like I was talking about, but look how nice those plants in the back. Okay, maybe if my Congo Tetris would get out of the way. I'm trying to show people the chocolate sword in the back. There we go. Um, let me just lock that focus right now. But man, these Congo Tetris, they're so pretty. Look at them. Look at that color on them. Anyways, the swords in the back have been growing really well. They're one of the only plants that I feel like did not have any problems with algae. So again, when I was doing the algae fighting, the important thing I did was like not do too many water changes so that the this this place has a has a chance to balance itself out. That's so important to people. And people don't understand that. Like they're like, why isn't everything happening perfectly in the first week? And that's the big problem. People keep doing water changes so that your system never has a chance to like establish an, an equilibrium. That's so important, right? The more nutrients there are, it doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that you need an extra plant or two to kind of go and take care of it. So that's the important thing. Also, look at this um, tail right here. It's literally just my pleco, my bristle nose. Again, I always recommend bristle nose plecos to clean your glass because in my opinion, plecos do very, very good jobs and the bristle nose is like the best in my opinion. They don't have, they don't grow huge like the common pleco will. They'll probably grow like six inches at most. And then they'll eat all the brown algae ever out of your aquarium. Um, they're super good. So it's a combination of algae eaters. Again, I've got a mono shrimp in here. I've got some, um, look, I've got some pink ram's horn snails right here. And I've got the plecos. And those three together has been incredibly awesome. I'm thinking about adding some more autosynclus catfish to help, you know, keep things clean. Because not only my getting rid of algae, I also want to get rid of, um, whatchamacallit, uh, excess food, which in my opinion though, like the Congo Tetras and the Cardinals and the Rominos do a really good job of cleaning up. And then I'll also see the, the Geophagus, Micro Geophagus right here. This is the German Blue Ram. They'll also clean up and they'll kind of pick at the ground. So all, all of those fish together contribute to keeping this place very, very nice clean environment. And I've got a red flame sword in the back. Um, it's this entire big plant here is actually the red flame sword. But as you can see, it's propagating itself. You've got a couple of different smaller plants, plantlets coming out of it. And then also we've got one right here. That's a red flame sword. So if you're looking for, you know, a nice little leafy, sorry, a nice big leafy sword to cover the back of your aquarium, consider these three. I've got Obviously, I've got some uh, Amazon swords over here. These are just generic green Amazon swords. These are the dwarf version, so they don't grow as big because I know, like, the chocolate sword is huge, right? Look at the, the couple of those together. The chocolate sword is really, really big. And then you've got the Amazon sword and uh, then the, the red flame sword, which are a little bit smaller here. And an Amazon sword will grow a lot bigger if I have gotten the original regular version. I also wanted to save some of my Anubias. You guys can see that a lot of these Anubias are yellowing and that's because I literally added them yesterday. I glued them onto these little rocks so they stay like in the ground or on the bottom. And these Anubias were just chilling in a bucket for a while. Oh my God. German blue rams are so beautiful. But yeah, I wanted to rescue them, so I put them in some, some CO2 enriched, nice fertilized water. As for my fertilizing routine, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but I actually just mix my own. It's um, miracle Grow with a little bit of urea. And this thing is potent. This is very, very potent. So 
when I'm fertilizing, I actually don't even need to fertilize most of the time because my fish poop and the fish food that I feed is enough to get things by. But if I feel like, you know, growth is stalling, there's a lot of like yellowing of the leaves and everything, I'll add some of this. And it's literally just a tiny pinch. Think about like you're seasoning your steak. Um, what, however much you, you season your steak with just a little bit of salt, I do that for like, that's enough for the entire place. So very, very little. And again, do this at your own risk. I don't want to get nasty comments down below of like, I would never do that. Like, okay, I get like, fish keeping is one of those things that if you don't feel comfortable doing something, you don't got to do it, right? I'm using Osmocote on the bottom for fertilizers. You can use root tabs. You can use fertilizing substrate. It doesn't matter. In my opinion, the, the, it's, it's very much opinion-based uh, fish keeping hobby this this is a very f opinion based um thing and if you, you know if you're someone that is very scientifically inclined and you know what you're doing then by all means go do that i don't have any shrimp in here enough water gets changed out of this tank for me not to worry about accumulating any sort of you know heavy metals or anything like that so Another thing about fertilizing is I don't dose iron. And, and, and this is uh, this myth that everyone talks about is red plants and iron. That's not simply not true. The If you understand the signs, you know that red plants create the red color as a way to block out too much sun. And it is only through more sun will you get more red so in when it translates to aquariums it is just blast them with light add more light of course you you add more algae when you do that but if you want your plants to be red that's what you do also the specific variety of plants are also super important you guys saw that my red flame swords were super red and if you guys want to look at this tank right here this guy this is um, Rotala Singapore, which is a super red plant. They're super red, but this plant has really bad meltback every time you move it to a new tank. It's also in the back here. And as you can see, under this whole layer of floaters, they're not as red as, you know, just having them in the tank right now. So that's also very important. The variety of plant will also make or break your aquarium. For those of you that are looking for some red plants to start off uh, with your high-tech aquariums, I would recommend the, uh, uh, the Ludwigia Super Red. It's a palustris species. So Ludwigia palustris, palustris. You could also see like Ludwigia Mini Red or something like that. Super cool, super easy plant. They propagate super fast. And you'll also see some in the back right next to the Rotala Singapore. I've had Rotala Atra before, and in my opinion, they look very similar. The Singapore is a little bit more finickier when it comes to transplantation. They melt back more, but it also keeps its red color a lot easier. Oh, and then we've got, you know, look at this Singapore right here. Look how red that center is, or the, the, the leaves are. And then next to it is the super red. On the other side, I have Rotala macrandra next to kind of growing out of that Amazon sword right here. Got a nice little funk, uh, you've got a nice little stem over here and all these fish are waiting for me to feed them. So why don't we go ahead and feed these fish and I'll talk about my feeding routine. All right, so usually when I feed these fish, I'll feed them these flakes right here. These were given to me actually, so I've never had to buy them, but they're also pretty old at this point. so. Fish food goes bad after about six months. All the nutrients in them, the vitamins, like the B12 that they add, they go bad because it, it oxidizes and the nutrients aren't really there anymore. Even though it doesn't smell bad, the nutrition content just isn't as good. So what I do is I actually um, won't be using this anymore. I'll probably toss it. Um, and that's why it's so important to buy fish food only enough that you can get through over a couple of months. I know it's really tempting to buy a huge, huge vat of fish food because it's cheaper, but um, if you really want your fish to do well, especially if you're breeding them for something, then um, you know just enough to get by is enough. So uh, 
So what I do is I actually, for the smaller fish, especially since I got most of these fish, as tiny, tiny little juvenile fish, and they've been growing here for about two months now, so they're a lot bigger now, but I would take these small little um, pellets, crush them in a blender, and then put them into these. This is a, again, I got this one off for, for free too, but this is, uh, this is from one of my friends and it's, you know, I didn't get sponsored by Aquarium Co-op, but I like their little tube um, dispenser system because it's essentially just a spray bottle at the top, a little nozzle that you can uh, crush them. So again, powdered foods for very, very small juvenile fish and I'll just put them in here and I'll just put some in there. But today I was just at the fish store and I picked up Tetra, what is this, Tetra Color. And this is the new fish food that I'm trying out. So you guys can see the, the top is literally not opened yet. So today, these are flakes instead of pellets, instead of uh, powders. But today we're going to open them and we're gonna try to uh, see how well my fish like the flakes. So here it is, giving you a, a better look inside. The color isn't really super colorful. So um, to me, it just means that, you know, just a different color choice. All right, so this is the Tetra color going in. Oh yeah, you can really tell that these uh, that these Congo Tetras are going crazy for them. They're super big food hogs. They'll come and like grab up all the food and then the other smaller Tetras. I'm gonna go all around so you guys can actually see what's going on. But all the other smaller Tetras are kind of below because you can, you can kind of tell that they've got the uh, mosquito fish, they're top dwellers, so they'll stay up there. But then the Congo Tetras have, you just follow anyone over here. You can kind of see that they they go up onto the top and grab it. Whereas a lot of smaller fish like that runny nose will um, prefer to stay like on the bottom. I say that and then it just goes up. But you guys get what I'm saying. Like, if you, and, and it's a little bit more, if you guys look at the overall big picture here. That, there we go. You guys can see the Tetras, like I said, Cardinals are all the way down here. The Rominos are sort of mid-water feeding to the top, and then got the Congos, which are super big, super bold, and then they will kind of just go through the entire thing like that. Dump it and oh, you got? Yeah, but I love this tank. It's so nice to be able to like come back after school and just watch them. So y'all, a little bit of background for this tank. I set this up a few months ago and essentially for this tank here, my goal is to be like the grow out tank for all of my fish. So whenever I'm trying to breed a new species, I'm putting them in here, I'm putting the breeders in there, get them nice and well adjusted, super healthy, super comfortable, and that's going to really help them like develop their eggs. So let's talk a little bit about conditioning your fish. The conditioning regimen that I have is incredibly like non-specific for any fish. So any fish that I have is going to be like, it's going to be like this. In the morning, I'll do some flake food or I'll do some pellet food, super easy. And I always feed twice a day. That's the important key. You want an abundance of food, but you don't want to feed too much each time. So twice a day feeding is a basically a must for me. So in the morning, I'll do like flake food, something easy that I can just put in and leave for work or whatever, or school. And then in the afternoon, I come back and I'll usually do some live feedings. So like baby brine shrimp or uh, blood worms. And those two are what I alternate between for now because I'm trying out some new stuff. Um, I'm using the flake food in the afternoon, but yeah, this is, this is how I condition my fish. Um, as you can see, all of them are eating so well and they all have super big bellies. And that's what we want. We want to see those big bellies. We want to see those like fish darting in and out of the leaves and the plants because that's really what's going to get them to like fully, fully get fed, really get really, really nice and big and be full of eggs. All right, so these are my blood worms. These are, oh, yeah. These are San Francisco Bay brand Sally's blood worms. These are frozen whole. It comes in a big block that you can get at like Petco, PetSmart, local fish store, whatever. And um, so this one expires in two years. So it expires March 2026. I'm definitely going to run out before 2026. But in general, like a year or so is fine depending on your usage. 
um, but it feel, it's it's super chunky, full of bloodworms. And what I'll do is I'll actually break them up into smaller pieces and then just store those individually. And then every time I need it, I can just float a little piece because I don't want to be thawing and de-thawing these bloodworms more than a couple times, right? Because I want to keep them fresh. The other thing is this is how I store my excess baby brine shrimp. So these are all brine shrimp, live baby brine shrimp that I hatched out. What I do is I'll take the excess, once I drain them and filter them and wash them a little bit so there's no more salt water, I'll put them in these little test tubes. And these test tubes are super helpful because A, I leave a little bit of air so that as the water expands, it's not going to bust open. And these are plastic, so I'm not worried about like the glass test tubes cracking in the freezer. So these test tubes have a lid, they're watertight. And what I'll do is, you know, once I'm done, I'll just thaw these out I'll just literally drop these you know, test tubes in. I'll drop them in like this with the cap on. I'll thaw them out and then I'll just pour the rest into the fish tank. I would not recommend opening this lid like this and putting them in there to de-thaw and slowly release its contents. It sounds like a cool theory, but I've had fish swim in, especially like small tetras. And I think when the Congo tetras were younger, they did this too. They're trying to get into there to get at like the bottom, right? Where all the baby brown shrimp is. So they'll actually get stuck in there and suffer wounds and injuries if you just open this lid and put them in there to thaw. So definitely don't do that. You can also just kind of leave them out at room temperature. I would also set an alarm because I forgot a couple times that I had these thawing out and so then they go bad. So definitely like this is how you do it. Literally just, just put this into a little bag like this. Boom, excess, Any anytime you make baby brine shrimp and there's excess, just put them in here. These test tubes are super, super cheap. A lot, every everything that I talk about today, all the links will be down in the description, except for maybe the flows, frozen blood warps. You can get this anywhere at a fish store in the fridge, right? Because I don't want to like, don't order them online because like, they're frozen. Um, but yeah, that's that's the breeding, guys. And so for the next few months, sorry if that was too loud, but for the next few months, I'm going to be growing out these rummy nose tetras. We're gonna do some green neon tetras, and then as the dude, look how fat these guys are right now. That's so cool. They're, they look so healthy. Gosh, look at that. Look how fat these guys are. But yeah, for the next couple of uh, months, I'm gonna be trying to breed the Congo Tetras, the Rummy Nose Tetras. We've already done German Blue Rams, we've already done the Cardinal Tetras, but I could always use more Cardinal Tetras. So I don't know if I'll you know, film another video that walks you through it. Maybe we'll leave, leave some you know, ideas down in the comments on what I should do with the Cardinals because I would love to make another video on breeding the Cardinal Tetras. It's been a couple of years and you know, I've got a lot more experience. So if you guys wanna see that, you guys wanna see another vlog style, let me know in the comments because this is so important. Like if you guys engage with my videos, it will push them more often. And that's how it comes to the top of your feed if I ever release another video. And then lastly, I just wanna show you this. I've got some green Kubatai with Boras. There's this one like chili right there but I've got to top this off and uh, yeah, that's it for now. This guy here is my breeding container. So I'm just like soaking up some, protecting it from the light. There's nothing in here. There's no eggs, I'm not bringing anything, but um, this is how I keep my Tetra breeding private because the Tetras really prefer like a very, very secluded spot. So I'll just put that fabric around them and then I'll use this little clip and clip them on. Thank you so much for watching everyone. That's it for this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you guys think this has helped you. I love making these videos. I love making these vlogs and I will see you in the next video.